Timothy chapter 3, and starting in verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. Amen. Of course, please be in prayer and be fasting about uh, the Great Plains Conference coming up. This is an incredible, it, it, it is invariably an incredible time in the Holy Ghost. Uh, every year that we've had it, I think the only year that we missed uh, was was 2020. And uh, every year that we've had this event, uh, God has has done something special uh, in in the services. And so please be in prayer, be fasting about that, be preparing yourself to receive from God. Uh, and then also come with a mindset of service. Uh, there's there there are going to be a large number of people from outside of Watertown. Uh, that are going to be represented here. And so uh, please come with a, a mindset of service, ready to, ready to bless the kingdom of God. We're not coming just to consume. We're coming to produce. We're coming to bless others. And I believe that God is going to, to take care of you and your needs in, in the moment where you're still serving somebody else. He can do that, and he can do that for you. Uh, so please have that mindset. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14, 14, when you're there, say amen. Okay. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. I'm thankful that we've got a children's ministry team. And then before that, I'm thankful that we have a church that is made up of, of dedicated and consecrated parents that are committed to teaching their own children and their own families the gospel in their own homes. From a, a young age, you can know the scripture. Uh, I was blessed to, to get a reminder uh, of a, a little video, um, a little video uh, of my, uh, she had to be about 18 months old, maybe uh, give it about two and a half, uh, two and a half years old at the time, uh, but my wife shared a video reminder of our youngest uh, reciting, quoting Acts 2 and 38 around the age of two. If you, if you put that into them, it's, it's in there, that's never going to leave, it's never going to go out. Uh, that doesn't mean we're special. That doesn't mean she's special. It just means that time and energy were invested in planting that seed inside of somebody's heart. And, and it's, it is a, a calling. It is a discipline for every parent. Uh, it is a commandment of Scripture for every parent to be teaching them diligently, to talk about them in your house, to talk about them in your car, to talk about them when you're sitting, when you're standing, when you're lying down, to talk about the commandments of God and to, to speak Scripture to your kids. But we, we are blessed to be in a setting where children are learning the Holy Scripture. They could be learning anything else. This world is doing its best to teach them anything else. But we can create a culture and we can create a space where our kids grow up not knowing exclusively about SpongeBob, but they, they grow up knowing, is that, is that still a thing? He's got to be like 30 by now. How old is SpongeBob? Somebody, somebody Google that after church. They don't have to know the latest cartoon characters. They don't have to, to know the, the fads or the, the things that are the rage. They can know Scripture, and they can know God. And here's the benefit of it. Verse 15 says, Which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. That's the beauty of knowing Scripture is it's able to make you wise unto salvation. Now, we've read these two verses several times, uh, and if, if you're nervous that we're in an unending series, we're not. Today's like the close of it, okay? Uh, 
So I thank you for being disappointed. I appreciate that. That's that's well trained. See, that was trained. All scripture. We should, you know what? Let's just read this together because we should have this memorized by now. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Amen. And tonight I'm going to, to wrap up part one. Uh, this is part four, but it's just the beginning of our summer of study. So this is our summer of study, part four, part one. <laughs> Next, we'll dive into specific areas of study. Uh, we, we've spent three weeks previous to this, and we'll, we'll do it a little bit today, trying to mix both uh, inspirational and practical application of the study of Scripture. Uh, by show of hands, has, any, has anybody actually been praying like we've been, we've been talking about? Has there been any prayer, God, let me have a greater hunger for Scripture that's occurred over the last couple of weeks of your life? I, I, I've noticed something inside of me as well, just a, a, a heightened reverence, a heightened uh, awareness, and, and we're going to talk about that for a little bit tonight, of the gravity... Of, of, of diving into the Word of God. If you were a doctor, or you know what, let's change the analogy. Let's say that you were a physicist, and you had blueprints for a rocket, and you were about to launch yourself and several other astronauts into orbit and head towards the moon. I'm pretty confident none of us would read the instructions once and then throw them away and just do, eh, I'm just going to eyeball it. I'm just, I, I know that rocket fuel requires a specific formula, but eh, what's, what's going to happen if you get the hydrogen and oxygen ratio off just a little bit? Well, I mean, I know that these heat-resistant tiles on our shuttle, they're, there, there's just a, a two millimeter crack. There's, there's just a little damage. It's okay. We've learned in, in, in humanity and in human pursuits that some things are just not all right to mix or mess with the formula. Some things are just not all right to allow damage to exist. I've looked at some vehicles that people are driving down the road and I've wondered how in the world is that thing still going? But highway travel is different than space travel. And, you know, our, our, our high school teachers, uh, at least when I was a teacher, they, they kind of demanded that you not be close to the right answer, but you have the right answer. And this thing called salvation is far more important than following the recipe and making sure that the banana bread comes out all right. This is the eternal salvation of your soul and your family's soul. And it carries weight. And that weight, that weight seems to be weighing a little bit more heavily as we dive deeper and deeper into Scripture. So let's look at 1 Peter, excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. We're going to read a couple of portions of Scripture, and then we're going to finish tonight with, with all practical. 2 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 19 says this, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures is of any private interpretation. Those three words, any private interpretation, is actually one word in the Greek, and it is the word idios. It means pretty much what you probably assume it to mean. Uh, no prophecy of any scripture is, is private or pertaining to oneself. It is not one's own. 
For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So what's this telling us? It's telling you and I that there is, in fact, a correct interpretation of Scripture. And there is not room for a private interpretation of Scripture. In our culture, there's my truth, there's your truth. But in the Bible, there's just truth. There is just Jesus Christ. I, I would caution any of us, and we, we briefly talked about this the other week, and we'll just touch on it again because I believe it's an important point. I would caution any of us from arrogantly thumping our chest and declaring, I have all truth. That is not the attitude with which we can approach Scripture. We have to approach with a posture of humility and a posture of hunger, ready for the Word of God to speak into our lives, ready for the Word of God to illuminate our hearts and our minds. There are some truths that are just out in the forefront. They are there. They are obvious. They are spoken in the Word of God. And he goes on in chapter 2 and verse 1. So the prophecy, uh, finishing up chapter 1, it did not come by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's a great verse of Scripture for you in, in your defense of uh, the, the inspired nature of the Word of God in the world that we live in today. People didn't write the Bible under their own whims. Every word was given by the inspiration of God. They were moved by the Holy Ghost and men of various walks of life, of various education levels, over thousands of years of human history penned these inspired words of God. And the beauty of it is, is from cover to cover, from front to back, there's no error, there's no falsehood in it. That does not happen when men begin to write their own books. But he says this in chapter 2. But there were false prophets also among the people. So while these prophets are of old are being inspired by the Holy Ghost and what we know as the Old Testament is being written, at the same time there are false prophets among the people whom God did not send to speak. And Look at the next sentence. Even as there shall be false teachers among you. So it wasn't just something that happened in Old Testament times. And it wasn't just something that happened in the New Testament church times. But it still happens today. There were people that spake not under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, but under the inspiration of another spirit or under the inspiration of human greed or covetousness. And they bring in, it says, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. And then they bring upon themselves swift destruction. There's a warning for those who desire to bring in or desire to teach falsehoods. It, 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 that's why James warns us, brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. The reality is, is I'm going to be judged more harshly than you. Anybody who, who takes it upon themselves to teach the word of God is going to be judged more harshly. And these people are wanting to speak the word of God and they're, they're prophesying falsely and some are bringing in damnable heresies and some are denying the Lord that bought them. And God says they're bringing upon themselves swift destruction. There is a result for somebody who, especially knowingly, but even ignorantly, begins to teach falsehood in the name of the Lord and declare it to be the truth of God's word. 
That's why we can't walk around pounding our chest arrogantly. But with humility, we're searching the scriptures like in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. They heard Paul and then they went home and they searched the scriptures to see whether these things were true. And that is the mindset. That's the attitude that you and I ought to have every moment. Every, you ought to be writing down every verse of a sermon. You ought to be writing down the main points. Don't just let it go out there, but let it come in to your heart. Weigh it against what you've read and what you know in Scripture. Go home with your notebook. Go home and open your Bible and begin to look at it and make sure that it aligns with the Word of God. And the real trouble of it all is verse 2. And it says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. That word pernicious, or more accurately, the two words pernicious ways, is apolia in the Greek. It means a destroying, utter destruction as vessels, as in, say, a vessel was to be smashed or to be completely destroyed. The problem with false teachers is somebody follows them. Somebody listens to them. And it gets to a point where the way of truth begins to be evil spoken of. There's a curious thing that has happened throughout the 2,000 years since Jesus established his church. In the United States alone, there exist about 40,000 denominations. And yet, God declared... I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There is a church. There is a church that Jesus began. There is a church that was, was given in Scripture. Now, I'm thankful to be a part of an organization. And I do believe that we're a part of an organization that is uh, to the best of our understanding and to the best of, of everything we've been able to have, teaching truth and practicing truth with a humble attitude and a humble spirit. And I know that there are those that would disagree with that statement. But God's going to have a church. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. To make merchandise, I'm sure uh, you, you, you may understand that, but just in case you did not, it means to use a person or a thing for gain, to go trading or to traffic. The truth is not something to be used as merchandise. You ought not get rich preaching the gospel. If, if that's your desire, you got a wrong attitude. Now, that's not saying that you're always going to be in the poorhouse either. There might be a season of both. Paul knew how to be abased and to abound. He knew how to want and he knew how to, to abound in having. He knew how to eat ramen noodles or to fast. And he knew how to eat a ribeye. He knew how to do both of those things. There are seasons of blessing and there are seasons of, of less blessing. But these false teachers with covetousness, with feigned or fake words, begin to use people to further their own advancement. Let, let me just say something here. If ever... The Jesus Church becomes something to me that is serving only to advance me. I'm in a very dangerous place. And I would expect the elders and the saints of this church who have recognized that to prayerfully be considering how to speak to me about it. If ever 
whenever spiritual leadership becomes about advancing self or using a platform or using a people, making merchandise of the people for their own glory, we've stepped into the realm of the world. We've stepped into the realm, as Jesus called it, of the Gentiles. You know how they want to be leaders and they want to sit in the seats of honor, but God has called us to serve. But there's a there's a mindset in this world today that wants to unmoor truth from anything absolute. It is not new to our culture. It existed in the Old Testament. It existed in the New Testament church. And it exists today. But truth, there is, there is absolute truth. There is black and white truth. And it is available. Let's go on to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 19. I'm going to read, uh, as you know me to do on Wednesday nights, a longer portion of Scripture. Uh, because I like to provide context. And so in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? How many of you today can earnestly and honestly say you were hasting unto the coming of the day of God where the heavens would start on fire. That's challenging, isn't it? But that's the manner of conversation and godliness with which we are to live. But it says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. There's not just a judgment where it's all going to be wiped clean, but there's a creation of that which is going to be perfect. And in this new heaven and in this new earth, there will indeed again be righteousness. There will indeed again be purity and holiness. God's perfect plan will be unfurled in this new heaven and this new earth. And so he says, wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Right? We've, we've talked about it several times now over the last couple of weeks, this attitude of diligence. We, we know that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We, we've, we've gone extensively through uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 that we are, are, are working, we're laboring, we're studying to show ourselves approved unto God so that we do not need to be ashamed. But knowing that there's a new heaven and knowing that there's a new earth, we ought to be looking for such things diligently applying ourselves to them. And so he begins to speak of the writings of Paul. And I like this because I understand this. Peter's, Peter's speaking my language right here. In verse 16 he says, Also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. What's, what are these things? He's talking about the day of the Lord. He's talking about righteousness. He's talking about the commandments of God. In which are some things hard to be understood. Can I get an amen? If you've ever read your Bible 
and you come to a piece of Scripture and you don't have an ever-loving clue of what you just read, just know that you're standing right there with the Apostle Peter. That's not reassuring for anybody else. It's reassuring for me, okay? I was like, all right. Me and, me and the Apostle Pete here, we, we look at some of the writings of Paul and we, we say, hey, you know, there's some hard to understand things in this Bible. Now, there are those which are unlearned and unstable, and they rest them. That means they wrench them. Actually, one of the meanings or contained within the meaning of this word rest is to torture, uh, specifically in the context of being stretched on the rack. All right? So the, the picture that Peter is drawing is they take these, these epistles that Paul has written and they begin to torture them and twist them and stretch them beyond what they were intended to be and what they were intended to say until they no longer say what Paul intended them to say. He said, people that are unstable and unlearned rest them as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Again, there is truth, and you and I must diligently seek it. We must diligently find it. This, we, we don't approach the Bible trying to find what we want to find. We approach the Bible with an open heart, with a, a humble heart, ready to let Scripture begin to speak to us. Uh, and in it, we begin to un unearth. And in it, we begin to dig out truth. And in it, we begin to see truth. We can't go to the Word of God with our own preconceived ideas or notions. We've got to go with a submitted and humble attitude uh, and a flashlight, as it were, and, uh, and uh, whatever metaphor you want to use. If it's a mine, we're digging in. Uh, we've got a pick. We've got a shovel. We're, we're beginning to go through it piece by piece, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, looking for the truth of the Word of God. Because to do otherwise is to risk Resting the word of God out of its proper use in context. And so he goes on and says this, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. It, again, one of the things that these last four weeks has, has done for me is just to, to heighten that, that desire to be biblically accurate. I don't want to just take a point because it preaches good. I don't want to just say a little verse out of context because it's one of our, our apostolic sugar sticks and I know I could get you shouting and running and swinging from chandeliers based on it. I don't want to do that. I want to preach the truth of the Word of God, and I want to be a part of an assembly that's hungry for truth, even when the truth challenges us, even when the truth begins to stir us, and it begins to inform us that maybe, just maybe, an area of my heart is wrong, and it's not in alignment with God's Word. I need that Word of God, not so that I can twist it out and make it say what I want to gain authority over somebody else, but no, I need it because I want to make it to the other side. When the elements begin to burn and when the heavens begin to be dissolved, it's only the grace and the truth that is found in Jesus Christ that is going to rescue me from a hell that was intended for the devil and his angels and to see me through to the other side. There's got to be such a deep-seated desire for absolute truth, for for black and white truth, uh, for the word of God uh, to be rightly divided over the pulpit uh, and in our homes and in our lives and in our conversations. Uh, it's got to consume us. Uh, there's got to be a passion inside uh, from a young age uh, all the way until the Lord calls us home. Uh, beware lest ye also being led away with the air of the wicked could fall from your own steadfastness. There's got to be a hunger for the truth of the word. But Peter says, 
in verse 18, but grow in grace. I'm so thankful that even though we live in a day and an age where there are false teachers that are preaching damnable heresies and there are false prophets that are speaking lies and sin is abounding and sin is waxing more and more wicked and our world is becoming further and further away from God. It is still possible for those who are hungry and humble to grow in grace. Uh, Even though sin is abounding, grace uh, is much more abounding. Uh, And if you'll hunger for it, you can grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And so the answer to a world in which truth is becoming less and less absolute is for the church to grow in the knowledge of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A year from now, you should know Jesus better than you know him right now. If you're 25 now, when you're 65, you better know a whole lot more about Jesus than you do right now. Well, if you've been walking with him for a year at the 10-year mark, you should know a little bit more about him than you know right now. Because there are so many, there, there's so much depth to our Savior. There's so much, there's so much wisdom. You, you, you can't get it all in your first pass. You become a student of the Word, and the Word becomes a student of you. And so there are those that will disuse or stop using this Bible. And you and I must reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to be able to take this Word to somebody that doesn't even believe it. And begin to share with them and demonstrate it to them. There are those that misuse the word of God. And so we must patiently, lovingly, and yet firmly and earnestly teach them truth. That is the responsibility of an end time church. To love truth, to live truth, to teach truth, to walk in truth, to raise your children in truth, to hold on to the truth, to pursue truth. Amen. Amen. Man, I get excited when, I'm, when we're talking about the Word of God. We're going to take a hard... A hard shift of gears now, okay? All right, everybody going to, are you going to stay with me if we do that? Okay. So I promised you last time that we would talk about some very practical things. How many know that there are different translations of the Word of God? (laughs) If you, if you've ever gotten into the Bible space on the internet, you find out very quickly it's just as contentious as every other realm on the Internet. If you want to have peace in your heart, here's a great tip. Never read the comment section. You're going to see some pretty disgusting humanity in the comment section. But there are differing styles of translation. Uh, two, or, or rather three, uh, as, as a general breakdown of it, there are what are typically referred to as literal translations. Literal translations of Scripture adhere as closely as possible to a word-for-word approach. And uh, at times, this can create a strange flow of words. Or a strange, uh, the word you could use would be syntax. Uh, You ever read a verse in in King James and you're like, that was a really wordy way to say something. That's because the King James, along with other translations like uh, the NASB or the New American Standard Bible, the ESV and Amplified, Amplified Classic, 
These are all considered more literal translations of the Word of God. So it's a word-for-word approach. Those that are immensely strong proponents of this approach and only this approach would argue that because every word is inspired and every, every word is important that you know, we, we need to translate this word for word. Another avenue of translation then is the dynamic equivalence. The dynamic equivalence, uh, an easy way to think of this would be it's, it's a thought-for-thought thought translation of, of Scripture. Uh, NLT, NIV would both be uh, well-known and, and commonly used dynamic equivalence translations. Now, uh, each of these are a spectrum, all right? You're, you're not, there's not like this hard dividing line. Uh, in, in certain areas, each of these translations will tend more literal. And then in other areas, they'll, they'll sway a little bit more towards dynamic equivalence. Also, there are some things called paraphrase or paraphrases. That is essentially to, to put it into modern language or to put it into uh, modern thought patterns or into one's own words. Uh, probably the most well-known scriptural paraphrase would be the Message Bible. Anybody ever read the Message Bible? <laughs> there are some gems in the Message Bible. Uh, in fact, at the Last Supper, um, the Message Bible translates one uh, verse of Scripture uh, into one such gem uh, because it has Jesus looking at Judas and saying, don't play games with me, Judas. Uh, and I kind of like that uh, because it's, it's a humorous take on, on Jesus uh, Talking with, with, with his betrayer. Don't play games with me, Judas. And so if I've ever said that to you, now you know why. <clears throat> now, paraphrases should not be viewed as authoritative. They're, they're not seeking to directly or literally translate the original language. They're, they're seeking to put it into one's own words. Okay. So the subject that gets a lot of, of attention online, I told you this was a hard shift, okay, is, uh, I'm just trying to decide how far we want to go here. How far do you want to go? Oh, we ain't got time for all the way, okay? This is a four-part series and it ends tonight. As uh, there, there is no original manuscript of, of the New Testament that exists. That, that doesn't have to scare us. That doesn't have to cause us concern or fear. There is an immense bulk of reproduced manuscripts that, that lend credence to one another, that agree with one another, and now you've got this... this Roman Empire-wide reproducing of Scripture that, as a vast rule, does not err or sway from itself. And there is a, a large amount of manuscript support for the New Testament. The Old Testament is, is a little bit easier to, to get confidently uh, or to look at older manuscripts, especially after the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in which manuscripts predating Jesus Christ were found that agree with our modern, our current uh, versions of books like Isaiah. But in the immediate post-biblical age, in the era of the, apost the post-apostolic fathers, in the era of the, era of the apologists, there began to be uh, two major schools of thought uh, or, or centers of thought in, in the Christian world. There was the Alexandrian area, and then there's the Antiochian area, uh, or the church in Antioch, where they were first called Christians, where uh, Paul and Silas taught and Barnabas taught, and they, they ministered there. It was their home base when they returned from the mission field. Now, 
some of the challenge in this arises when uh, you, you begin to look at the Alexandrian school of thought, and it was more heavily influenced by Greek philosophy and tended towards a more allegorical interpretation of Scripture. Okay? So, an allegorical interpretation of Scripture would be to approach the Word of God looking for symbolism or the deeper meaning of the text. If you have an allegorical mindset, the real isn't allowed to be the real. It's a method of interpreting a literary text that regards the literal sense of the text as just a vehicle for a secondary, more spiritual and profound sense. For example, you could look at the story of David and Goliath. And you could begin to find the deeper truth underneath the story of David and Goliath. Well, bless God, that giant was the giant of the United States' debt. And David, David was, David is, is, he's he's an allegory of Donald Trump. And Donald Trump is going to go and he's, it's going to take him five attempts. But he's going to win re-election and he's going to, he's going to bring that giant down. Now, that's absolutely foolish, and I made that up on the spot. But the problem with an allegorical interpretation of Scripture is that there's nothing that stops you from doing that with any area of Scripture. When you don't allow the real to be real, you can, you can read into Scripture, or you can, you can, of your own desire, pull out of Scripture anything that you want. Look, Goliath was really a giant. David was really a shepherd. He was really a ruddy-faced shepherd boy that had already been anointed to be king. And he really used a sling and five smooth stones, and he really chopped the head off of a giant. That really happened. It was a real thing. Now, there are many sermons contained in that, but it's included in Scripture to inspire us to know that God can help us to slay giants, not to read something else into it. And so the Alexandrian school of thought began to tend towards a more allegorical interpretation of Scripture, whereas the Antiochian school of thought tended towards a more literal interpretation of Scripture. As time goes on, uh, and as we get further and further away from the life of the apostles and the life of Jesus Christ, man's philosophy influences Christianity more and more. Okay, and so we're going to we're we're not going to go all the way. We have to keep moving. This is a fascinating study. If you want to see some of the resources I used for this, uh, you can see me after church. We can talk about it more. Uh, We can we can dive into it a little bit more. There began to be an institutionalized church. Uh, We we know this now, of course, as the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, The Roman Catholic Church was not the original church. All right, can we, can, we just, can we settle that in our hearts? Peter was not the first pope. Peter baptized in Jesus' name and demanded that people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost as evidenced by speaking in other tongues. All right? Peter, Peter was, not, was not operating under the auspices of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. But the Catholic Church and the, the language of the church, and to a large degree until we move about a thousand years forward in human history, the language of many common people was Latin. And so a guy named Jerome produced what's called Jerome's Vulgate, and this is the Latin Bible version that was created by the institutionalized church. And this, this version of the Bible centered off of the manuscripts from the Alexandrian school of thought, the more allegorical reading of Scripture. And then the, the rulers and the popes decided this is the version of the Bible. This is the one. And so for the exclusion of all others for a period of about 1,000 years, Jerome's Vulgate was what was used. The problem with that is that Latin became essentially a dead language unless you were clergy. They reach a point in time in which none of the common people can read the Bible. Also, many of the common people can't read. And so they become ever more reliant upon this institutionalized church to teach 
Scripture to tell them what the Bible says. That does not mean that there are not other manuscripts that are in circulation, but it does mean that possessing these manuscripts, uh, like many other things in this day and age, could find you burning at a stake. Not burning a stake. You are the stake on the stake, and you're burning. All right? We brought stake into it. We did it at least once a service. So this then brings up what is called the Textus Receptus. Now, this itself is a descendant of the old Latin Vulgate, but it's centered on the Antiochian manuscripts. And in 1516, it is compiled by a guy named Erasmus. Now, of note, when Luther nails his theses to the wall of a a church and then he begins to break apart from the Roman Catholic Church, he takes the Textus Receptus and he translates that into German. The original break with the Roman Catholic Church brought in the manuscripts from outside of the institutional church, okay? Now, here's how serious they were about the protection of Jerome's Vulgate. By the way, Jerome was the personal secretary of the Pope. So if you think that his translation of it was 100% fair and above board, I'll let you decide that on your own, okay? And so here's how serious they were about it. A guy named Wycliffe translated Jerome's Vulgate into English, And they condemned him as an heretic. But before they could kill him, he died of a stroke. And so as one does, they dug up his bones and they burned him at the stake. Because that's what you do. And then a guy named Tyndale took the Textus Receptus and translated that into English. Now, he was also convicted of heresy, and he died by strangulation and then was burned at the stake. So never take for granted the ability to possess and read a Bible in your native language. Because people quite literally died to give you this for you to be able to read it. It's not just coffee table decoration. People died for you to read this. Okay, so the reason that the KJV debate exists at all is because the KJV, was, it was not the first, but became the most authoritative, comprehensive translation of the Textus Receptus. The Textus Receptus was the school of manuscripts that existed outside of the Roman Catholic Church. And so the KJV became... Uh, the, the English language Bible from outside the institutionalized church. Every other modern translation uh, comes from the other school of manuscripts or the other school of thought or descended itself from Jerome's Vulgate. Now, did that interest anybody? So I've got some blank stares and I've got some people that are like drooling right now. Okay. Let me make this disclaimer statement. We've we've already studied, we've already talked about how God has promised to preserve his word. I'm not standing here in front of you saying that, bless God, KJV is the only way to do this. That's, That's not, listen, you can find some nuts out there that are pretty intense about the KJV. I ran into one guy that that asked me, this was a serious question. Yeah, but do you know how many words are in that chapter? I don't know. No. But the number of words and the number of letters in the chapter meant something to him because it was from KJV. And those other versions, they don't have the same number of words and the same number of letters. Buddy, you missed the truth of the chapter because you're busy counting the letters and the words. You're missing the point. And so... I'm I'm not saying this is a KJV-only church, okay? But I will say this. All of my doctrinal study and all of my memorization occurs within the King James. Number one, because I grew up with it and I like it. But number two, because I, I like where it came from. But 
it's a, I, I'm not condemning anybody. There's an NLT Bible that was on the floor over there, okay? It was a nice one. I picked it up. I felt it. I, I was like, man, this is nice leather. Listen, God has preserved his word. You can find that you need to be baptized in Jesus' name in virtually any translation of your Bible. You can find it in the NLT. You can find it in the NIV. I've done it. I've looked at it. I've studied those portions of Scripture. Why? Because I want to make sure if I'm going to use it that those truths are in there. And God has protected the truth of his word. Whether you're reading the NIV or the KJV, you're going to find that there's only one God and his name is Jesus Christ. Whether you're reading the NLT or the NASB or the KJV or the NKJV, you're going to find uh, that you must repent of your sins and be born again of the water and the spirit. You will find that. And so here's what I would ask. You might be a KJV only person in this church, but I ask that you would respect the views of others. You might not have a conviction against the KJV and your brother or sister that that does They might rub you the wrong way. I ask you to get along with them and then do this. Read whatever version you have in your hands, as long as it's not the message. Let's get you something a little bit more direct here, not a paraphrase. Read and apply whatever you have in your hands. And then go teach somebody else the Word of God, based on whatever version you're going to read. Can we just agree to do that together? Read Scripture and apply it to your life. Okay. So we've talked about allegorical, and obviously I I hope you picked up that that is not the best way to interpret Scripture. That brings us into the realm of private interpretation of Scripture. Well, Well, When I read that, this is what it means to me. No, 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 no. We just read that no scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, that that doesn't mean that in your devotional time you're not reading through the Psalms and a verse jumps out at you and it provides, uh, you know, your car broke down and all of a sudden this verse of scripture is providing. Listen, David didn't write it about a car, but the word can still minister to your present day need, okay? I'm not saying that That doesn't happen. But we don't get to have a completely different viewpoint of the story of David and Goliath. He doesn't get to be Donald Trump to you and David to me. That's a ridiculous, man. Anyways, i got to stop doing that. So there's something called the grammatical historical method. Or if you don't feel like remembering all that, it's the literal method. The literal method holds that the meaning of any text can be determined by the considerations of grammar and history. Now, this is not just for biblical studies, but this is for all textual studies. Now, we, of course, are talking about the Bible because I don't think any of us are reading ancient Greek philosophy and poetry. Uh, If you've got free time to do that, I've got some Bible study charts for you. (laughs) Please use your time wisely. We find this to be an, a correct way to interpret Scripture because when the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament by Jesus and by the apostles, it is always interpreted literally. Jesus and the apostles always bring a literal interpretation of it. And then there, there, there's an occasion where Paul makes an allegory about uh, the, the, the bond woman's son and the free woman's son, but then the son is still a son, the woman is still a woman, and he makes a literal application out of this. Now, the grammatical historical method makes allowance for genre in symbolic language. There are figures of speech in your Bible that are used as a means of revealing literal truth. Anybody ever heard the phrase or the the word idiom? English language has idioms or these short little phrases that, not idiot, idiom. Short little phrases that don't literally mean what they're saying. And to non-native English speakers, they are quite confusing. If English is not your first language, when somebody says they're going to kick the bucket, you start looking for a bucket. You're like, 
That's an idiom, okay? Or if, if something gets your goat, what does that mean? It gets you upset. It, it fires you up. But to somebody that is not familiar with that idiom, you start looking around for some gregarious mammal. And you're like, where's the goat? There are idioms. And so these idioms exist inside of both Greek and Hebrew, especially inside of Hebrew. Now, the literal translation and especially or the literal method and the literal translation will sometimes interpret these things very literally. And so there'll be moments in especially uh, older versions of text like the King James where you read something and you're like, What? But what's happening is that there's a Hebrew figure of speech, and it's, it's, it's flowing forward. Here's one from in John chapter 2 and verse 4. We, uh, we talked about this just a, a couple of Sundays ago. Uh, Jesus says, you know, woman, what hath this to do with me? To his mother, okay? In, in the Greek, completely literally translated, it would be woman, what to, to me and to you? What to me and to you? is an idiom. It doesn't make sense in English. It doesn't flow in the syntax of our, our sentence structure. But what it means is, this has nothing to do with us. This is none of our business. And so Jesus is quite simply saying to his mother, this isn't our business. This isn't our consideration. All right, does that make sense? And so the literal method, you'll come across some of these things where you're, you're reading it, uh, and so you, you don't have to panic about it. You don't have to, to be worried about it. You, you don't have to freak out when you read something you don't understand. But you can begin to peel back some layers, look at the context, look at what's going on, talk to somebody about it, talk to Jesus about it. Use some of those tools that we talked about in part three. You can begin to pull up the lexicon. You can begin to, to dive into the sentence structure and look at the surrounding words. And you might arrive at the, at the conclusion that huh, this, is, this is an idiom. This is a figure of speech. Okay? Because we've all made an agreement that we're not going to just read past things we don't understand. If it arrests your attention and you can't make any further progress of the day, so be it. Maybe you fall a day behind on your Bible reading plan. But if you gain understanding of a piece of the word of God that you did not have before, you've been blessed. Okay. A couple of words you might hear, and we're going to wrap up. Uh, hermeneutics, this is your approach to the word. Uh, it's the interpretation. It's, it's how you're studying it. Okay. Okay. Two words that you're going to, to hear if you have not heard already. Exegesis and eisegesis. Okay, so exegesis is a critical examination of a text. You're digging into it to find the meaning of the text. Eisegesis is the process of interpreting the text to fit your own biases or presuppositions. You're reading into the text. Okay? Now, which one of those sounds like a proper approach? Let's try that again. Exegesis, that critical examination of the text, digging into it to find meaning. Okay? But then we have two important questions. There's a word called exposition. What does it mean? And then you'll hear a word called homiletics, from which we get the word homily. How does it impact my life? So the point of all of this is that an exegetical study can lead to expository preaching and teaching, which gives us improved homiletics. We see what the text means, we communicate what the text means, and then we apply it to our lives. The entire purpose of you reading the Bible is not so that you can make it say what you want it to say to win an argument, but it's to find out what it really means and how it applies to your life. That's why we're studying the Word of God. 
We're going to, there, there are several, as we close together, we're wrapping up right now. See, if I say that phrase, it's like the magical, buys me five more minutes. 30 more seconds. We close with this. If I do it twice, does that get me 10 minutes? No? Okay. Let's all stand together. <laughs> now it's really serious. Three minutes. Okay, there are various methods of, of studying Scripture or various ways to, to digest or to take apart a word of God. Uh, what's the English idiom? There's more than one way to skin a cat. Has anybody ever skinned a cat? I haven't either. I don't, I don't want to find more than one way. But there is more than one way to study Scripture. And at various moments of time, you'll use different methods. Okay? Most of us, on a regular basis, are undergoing a devotional method of study. It's closely related to, we've talked about meditation and memorization of Scripture extensively. And so you're chewing on it until the Spirit begins to illuminate it on how, or illuminate portions of it on how to apply it to your life. This is encouraging each of us to be a doer of the Word. Another method that you could do would be to summarize a chapter. Read the chapter. Read it again. Ask content questions of the chapter. In your own words, begin to summarize the central thought of the passage. Begin to follow the threads of cross-referencing. If it stirs a, a memory of this portion of Scripture, tie that in. Begin to, to diagram that chapter. A fun one is a biographical method of study. There are some characters in the Bible whose lives are tremendously important. You, you could do a like months-long study on the life of Abraham. You absolutely could. I once listened to a 28-part series on the faith of Abraham. And I loved every second of it. Because there's so much there. That's why he's called the father of the faithful. He, he's a, a massively pivotal figure in scripture. And then you could find somebody like Barnabas. And do a, a biographical study on Barnabas. And be blessed because of it. So you compile the life and character of a Bible figure. Look into their successes. Look into their failures. Because the Bible contains all of that. I love it. It contains all of their failures. Topical study. Pick a subject or, or better yet, let the Holy Ghost pick a subject for you and trace it through Scripture. If you've never done this with core doctrines, you should do this. Well, that went over like bacon at a bar mitzvah. If you have never gone through Scripture and done an in-depth study on the mighty God in Christ. You should do so. If you've never gone through Scripture and found every verse you can possibly find about repentance and baptism in Jesus' name and receiving the Holy Ghost and, and really diving into what the Bible says about holiness and sanctification, you should engage in that topical study. It would be immensely helpful for you. There's a key in each of these methods. It's the same key from before. We're not studying just for increased knowledge, but we're studying to apply and to do what the Word of God says. We're not just studying. There are people with doctorate degrees in Scripture that have far more knowledge than you do but they can't hold up candle to your obedience. And guess which one God would prefer? It's not about just knowing. It's about doing the word of God. And so each of these methods and all of these tools we've talked about and all of this hunger, it is all for us to properly and rightly divide it so that we can do it and walk in obedience to it. Amen. Let's close with this. Jeremiah 15 and 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them, 
and thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. I'm thankful that I have never reached a saturation point of the word of God, but there's always something new. There's a daily bread that he prepares for us. We can dive into that word of God and every day receive sustenance from it, receive nourishment from it, receive blessing from it. And if you'll live that way, you'll find it to be the joy and the rejoicing of your heart. Psalm 119 and verse 18. We've read it before. We read it again right now. Last verse of scripture. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I am so thankful to be a part of a Bible believing church and a Bible hungry church. Would you lift your hands as we close tonight and would you ask God one more time, Lord, would you open my eyes?